Latinos for more than a decade have accounted for 52% of all net new mortgages taken out every year. And when they survey, there's one common theme. Latinos believe in the American dream. Look at COVID during the peak pandemic period of time. Guess who the patriots of this country were? They were the workers on the front line. And the Latino cohort was there serving everybody. The Marine Corps Commandant of the United States was recently quoted as saying, I'm telling my people we're filled up as far as Latinos go. We got to look for somebody else because our entire core is being filled with Latinos. There's more Latinos at a faster rate in the Marine Corps than any other cohort in the history of the United States. Agua. My daughter said something to me the other day. And uh, I want to share it with you because, you know, sometimes the experiences that I have are in many ways the same experiences that you have. I mean, after all, I mean, we're all just trying to get by, right? In the best way that we possibly can. And, and this is a Latino show, and we tell Latino truths, and we share stories of what it's like to be a Latino in the United States of America, right? We're Latinos, U.S. Latinos. Well, we talk to everybody, but, but I think this is particular, particularly poignant, and, and I want to share it with you because it, it meant something to me. Savannah says to me recently, she says, hey, Dad, I, uh, I want you to know something. I said, you know, me and my brothers were talking to mom and we don't say this to you as much maybe as we should, but we wish, we just want you to know that we really appreciate how hard you work and everything that you've done for us. You know, it's funny, but um, even just saying it now makes me want to well up a little bit thinking about it because I don't know. You know, it's, it's the relationship that we have with our kids is important. And, and, you know, obviously I love my daughter and I love my, my boys as well. I got three boys and a, and a girl and the girl's always the one who's always the most expressive for some reason. And maybe it's because, you know, I often think that, uh, I have a friend that you're going to be meeting in just a little while. He's one of my dearest friends in the whole world. And I remember when we were first becoming friends, he and I had a long conversation about who we are as Latinos in this country. And, and you know who we are? We're workers. We're, we're workers. I mean, we work hard. I, I don't know why. It's maybe instilled in us. Maybe it's part of our DNA. But sometimes in what we go through as, 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 as men and women who happen to be living in this country has to do with that experience. And, and sometimes I think... In my own little way, for example, as many of you know, I was fired by CNN and, and then I had to go to work. And I'll tell you, man, I, 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 I took on four jobs. I, I had a job teaching school in the morning and then I had a job doing a radio show in the, uh, around noon and, and then I had did a TV show after that and, and, and then I did a, a, a show on Fox News after that. I had four shows. So it was, it was you know, relentless. Up at 5.30, go to bed late. And then when we started, you know, building this little thing we called Cano Health, it was a heck of a, a heck of a run as well. And it's shooting a show five days a week, serving as, a, you know, as a CMO. And uh, Saturdays we were doing outings and uh, opening new clinics on Sundays. So it was seven days a week. Suzanne, my wife and I and the kids, we haven't had a vacation in 10 years because it's just been relentless. And so sometimes I think to myself, I think, Am I, am I spending enough time with my kids? Am I, am I, am I loving them enough, you know? So when Savannah said that to me, it made me think that, yeah, it's a sacrifice. It's what I saw my parents do, and it's what I do. And you know what it is, too? It's what I, it's what we do. It's, it's what we do. It's who we are. We are let's face it, we're an industrious bunch. And, and the reason I'm sharing this story with you is because this last three or four days, including part of this weekend, I, I had a chance to go to a place where Latino thought leaders and Latino business people all came together. Tens of thousands of people either there or, or plugging into what was going on to talk about who we are in this country and where we're going. 
And what Savannah told me was what I saw there, duplicated, multiplied. It, it wasn't my story. It was all of our stories. In fact, here's a taste. The engine of growth in the United States today, there's a cohort that's driving 70% of most of the growth in the United States today, which is the U.S. Latino cohort. And leapfrogging France, UK, and India is huge. This is the most important annual report that we've ever released. It tells the story not just of the strength that they provide, but really importantly, the resilience that U.S. Latinos provide and that the country benefits from. This cohort, and this cohort is the third fastest growing cohort in the world. And as we just learned from uh, Saul and the Latitudes board, and one, one more time, round of applause, we are now number five in the world. That's the Latitudes Conference. It takes place every year in San Diego. And I, I got to tell you, being a part of this thing this year was just so special. I mean, I've gone to Latitudes in the past, but I just, this thing is, it's, it, it's a celebration of grit, a celebration of success, a celebration of who and what Latinos are and what they're doing in this country. And it fills me with so much pride to say that and to invite my partner and my one of my dearest friends in the whole world, and by the way, my mentor, uh, Saul Trujillo, who joins us now live to to talk about this and 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 to talk about what it means. And even before we begin the discussion about latitudes, I, I have to say something about Saul, which I, I think is just marvelously important. And, and it's this. This thing that you saw at Latitudes that now everybody is seeing, I, I got to tell you guys, I mean, I, I hope, and, and we're going to do things, I, I want to I make sure you all can experience this too, and, and hopefully you'll be able to do it. But it was the former president of the United States, it was the CEO of Nike, it was the CEO of every major bank in the world, it was every thought leader, it, it was the entertainers, it was athletes, it was this convergence of these very powerful people wanting to be a part of this. And the reason I say it in those terms is because just, you know, I don't know, 10 short years ago, that didn't exist in this country. 10 short years ago, we had a guy named Joe Arpaio and a guy named Lou Dobbs and a woman named Jan Brewer. One of them was a governor. One of them was a sheriff. And one of them was a bigot who had a television show on CNN. And uh, God bless their souls, man. But they woke so many of us up. They said horrible things about Mexicans and about Latinos. And this man whose voice you're about to hear, he heard that. He heard that. And something in his belly said, I got to do something. I got to do something. And he did. And, 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 you know, and he, and he called other vatos. He got me and, you know, who am I? I'm just a guy who was doing the news, but, and he called all of his friends and he said, we're going to create our story and it's going to be called latitudes and we're going to meet every year and, and we're going to bring everybody together and we're going to be able to show what we are and what we've done. And son of a gun, he did it. And, and, and that's who Saul Trujillo is. So um, before we get into the story of latitudes and the statistics and the metrics, which are unbelievable, the depiction of who Latinos are now in the United States, I, I just want you to meet Saul. And I've got to start with the question, why did you do it? What drove you to do it? How did you come to that decision in that place in your life? as one of the most wealthy, successful business persons in this country, to suddenly take that pivot? Well, Rick, I think, first of all, um, I'm an American. While I was living in Australia, watching the news, actually seeing you, Rick, on CNN, interviewing this governor in Arizona, this Sheriff Arpaio, and also protesters who were talking about becoming you know, uh, they wanted immigration, they wanted a lot of things, and they were carrying a Mexican flag, which were all the wrong pictures for me, because this is the United States of America. We all want to be citizens and participants in this country, and 
and we had this dichotomous conversation going on. And for the first time in the history of our country, we had sanctioning of profiling a cohort called the Latino cohort uh, in Arizona, which was wrong, un-American, any descriptor that you want to add to it. So while I was there in Australia watching this happen, I said, this is wrong. This is my country. I grew up thinking about this guy named Ronald Reagan. And ultimately, in the case of Latinos, he was the first president that really understood the value of the next wave of immigrant immigrants and immigration that needed to occur, where at that point in time, he said, let's make, let's create the opportunity for Latinos that want to be here and want to be citizens and not just Latinos, anybody that was here as a, as an undocumented uh, worker that they, they could stay and they could have the opportunity to stay, but they had to go through steps. They had to go through process. And it's turned out to be the biggest investment that a president of the United States of America has made in the last 30 to 40 years. So now as a business guy, I think about that and I say, okay, I'm going to go look at the data because I have to have data before I draw opinions. I don't pull opinions out of places that other people pull opinions out of. I pull them out of data. And what happened was, Rick, that during the Reagan era, we had the highest GDP growth in the modern era of the United States of America. And when you look underneath that, you say, ¿Y por qué? Why? Then you look and see that we had the highest rate of labor force growth rate that we've had in, you know, since the war, you know, World War II, when everybody came back from war and started working again. And so what happened was he then supplemented that with this notion of having people become documented that were here without documents, whatever it might have been. Mm -hmm. And he, he turbocharged the economy because when people talk about gross domestic product, the calculation of it is output of goods and services times numbers of workers. Right. Plus investment, plus, you know, some elements of consumption and we're of a consumption based economy. So here's a guy that said, let's create a new roadmap for growing our economy. Well, guess what happened during his tenure? Our average GDP growth was almost three and a half percent over eight years. And then he created the, the, the track for the next president, Bill Clinton, to come in and build on it and live off of it both. And he had another three and a half percent average GDP growth rate. So for 16 years, the United States of America was growing GDP at three and a half percent. And guess what was the underlying driver variable underneath? It was labor force growth rate. It wasn't an unemployment rate. It wasn't all these other things that people throw around today. That's the one driver variable that we tend to ignore in conversations today, listening to the Fed chairman, where he's looking to, to affect, you know, inflation in the sense of we've had inflation out of control. We've had supply chain issues Correct. that have not been solvable. And I'm, I'm just a simple business guy, Rick. So I look for a root cause because I like to fix problems, not talk about them, not describe them, but fix them. And the one thing that has been driving inflation has been wage inflation. And wage inflation, you know, we saw some numbers last year, about 32% increase in, in salaries and costs for, for labor. And it's because we have a supply shortage. We have 10 million, 11 million unfilled jobs. We don't have enough workers, 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 workers at all levels of our ecosystem, not just frontline people in agriculture, whatever. It's there, yes, but it's all over. We don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough techs. We don't have enough everything. So the punchline here for me has been, okay, I'm not going to talk about it and point fingers at other people. We're going to go gather the data, and we're going to look at root cause issues. We're going to look at how do we solve it, and we have one cohort in the United States of America that is growing and is going to continue to grow 
for the rest of this century at a disproportionate rate. And it is the U.S. Latino cohort. So I'm sitting there while I'm sitting in Australia looking at my country, hearing Rick Sanchez on CNN interviewing both sides of the issue and saying, I don't want the people in my country to be pendejos, as I like to say, meaning people that don't get it, people that might be, you know, labeled as stupid or idiotic or whatever, because we're not looking at the real thing here. And so Latitude, the Latino Donor Collaborative was created to gather data so we could have irrefutable data. And then secondly, Latitude was created as the platform so that we, we all citizens of the United States of America could take advantage of a data-based conversation packaged around people that are resource allocators and influencers in our country, packaged around seeing the vis- the visuals mm-hmm. of Latinos and Latinas that are the most entrepreneurial cohort in America, the most productive cohort, the most patriotic cohort, the most, most of everything cohort. And that's where we came together as an example this past four days. And it was a big success as measured by those who came on stage by those who were there in attendance, and by those who were also there as observers, the media and others, the the coverage was dramatic because there was fact-based conversation, compelling data that says the U.S. Latino cohort is the fifth largest economy now in the world if it were a standalone country. And everybody now understands, gee, there might be a correlation to, as Steve Forbes said, The U.S. Latino, and I'm sorry, he didn't say that. He said Hispanics are like the cavalry already coming over the hill to save the economy. Well, so that's the story, Rick, and I'll stop there. You know, it's 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 fascinating to hear you say it because it's what I started to hear six, seven years ago when you and I first started talking about this. And and here's the difference that I think we all have to understand about Saul's approach and others' approach. Yes, I I was one of those who was on TV and I was doing my best at CNN and I probably got myself in trouble for it because I was a little too loud and a little too proud and maybe I should have held my lips or, you know, held my thoughts a little bit. But Saul took a different approach to this. There were people at the time who were protesting Joe Arpaio and protesting Jan Brewer and holding up signs and 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 saying this is terrible and why are they saying these things about us and these people are wrong and they shouldn't do it. But nobody was refuting the argument with data and metrics. See, if if there's one thing that I learn, and I think you need to learn too, from Saul is that he has never once come at this and said, well, I'm going to sit here and get sad or cry or complain or wah, wah, wah about what they're saying. No, he's never done that from the very beginning. And by the way, we're talking to a guy who is the trade advisor for President Clinton and President Bush, was the CEO, one of the most important CEOs in three different quarters of the world, in Australia and France and England and the United States. I mean, talk about a guy who's worldly. Talk about a guy who could just take, you know, his wealth and go get a yacht or a boat or something. I don't know, a couple of horses and just sit around and count his money. And he said, no, I'm, I'm going to tackle this. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to show the world and U.S. citizens of all stripes, that Latinos, when measured, are contributing thusly. That's what he did. And it's kind of, it sounds simple now, but nobody else thought of it. And and that's what we just celebrated at Latitudes in San Diego. That, that's exactly what was celebrated. It wasn't, oh, look at us and we feel bad because those people said nasty things about us. No, who cares? They can say whatever they want. Here's the facts. Here's the metrics. Here's the numbers. And that's, I'm sorry, Saul, I don't want to sound like your cheerleader, but that's the Trujillo difference, man. That's it. Yeah. And, and you know, Rick, thank you for saying that. But, but uh, you know, I really, the root cause of what I'm doing is for my, for my country, for my kids, my grandkids, 
maybe their grandkids. Because I love my country and I love, and I have experienced operating business in communist countries, mm -hmm. in dictator led countries, in monarchy like countries. I've been everywhere, man, as they said in, <laughs> in one of the commercials once upon a time. And, and so I've seen about everything. And what we have here in, in our country here in the United States of America with a constitution that had such foresight and prescience and also a bill of rights yeah. that allowed people to be people of equal stature, regardless of who you are or where you came from. I mean, these are, are so unique and so important, so valued that when I look at my country and I see now, right now, what I call the divided states of America, I'd say, why are we divided? I can complain about it and point fingers and call people names and I can do all of that, which some of it is true. But I say, no, no, no. Our job is to bring people together, reduce the amount of fear that exists. And yes, there's always going to be a cohort of people that just like to hate and they're going to hate. But if we can get the vast majority of Americans to come together and understand that we're one, you know, we're familia, as I like to say, of latitude, everybody that was there, whether you were a Latino or Latina or an Anglo or an African-American or whatever Asian-American that were there, we're familia mm -hmm. because we're talking about a common view of our country, a common future for our country, and a competitive winning environment for our country. Well, and nothing seems more important now that we should address than the fact that Latinos, who used to be the seventh largest GDP economy in the world, we learned this weekend just moved into fifth place. That means Latinos, if they were a country, if we were a country, we would represent the fifth largest and most powerful economy in the world, only behind what? The United States, China, India, Germany, and then us. I mean, that means we're ahead of Brazil, we're ahead of Great Britain, we're ahead of the, you know, Italy. Um, this is really powerful stuff, which goes to what you are saying, Saul. If if we're the fifth largest economy in the world and we're within the United States of America, take us out and our country becomes, I don't know, the Netherlands? This is important for all of us, right? Yeah, yeah. If you took the Latino cohort out of the mix in the United States, we'd grow, in terms of absolute volume, one-third less. Wow. So the U.S. Latino cohort is generating, although they're about 18, 19, 20 percent of the total population, they're generating about 30 percent of the volume growth of the United States uh, of America. But their growing consumption, remember, we're a 70% consumptive-based economy. Mm -hmm. Their growing consumption in this last report, nearly 3x over a period of time as the rest of the economy. So this cohort is critical and essential for what is already happening. But guess what? There's an even better side to it. There's catalyzation that can happen. There's more engagement that can happen if Latinos were covered. So I want to make two points then. Mm -hmm. I'm a capitalist. So everybody that knows me knows I'm a capitalist. I love competing. But I also believe that capitalism should work, you know, as a principle. And right now, 21st century America, it's not working as well as it could. And here's the reason why. You have a cohort that's generating 80% of all net new businesses, 50% of all employer-based businesses, supplying 80% of the net new labor force entrance, and growing consumption 2x, 3x, the rest of the economy. That's Latinos in, a, in America. Think, which, yeah. is, which are the Latino cohort. Right. Which then you would think there would be huge amounts of capital flow into it. Uh -huh. But we did a study last year with Bain Consulting, and Bain did the, the work. And they found that it, after surveying the 25, per, 25 top PE firms, 25 top VC firms, less than 1% of invested capital went into this cohort. So you're sitting here in a capitalist country. <laughs> I'm a capitalist saying there's something wrong. So rather than saying, assuming the worst of people, you say there's a clog in the system. That's what I say. So let's figure it out. 
and how do we unclog the system? Well, the one thing is that capital is the thing that needs to flow wherever the growth is. Right. Why not? Well, we have a lot of traditional structures and institutions and processes that were built in the 20th century that aren't working in the 21st century. It's led to this huge concentration of wealth, wealth in individuals, you know, where we have, I don't know, 138 people. I saw a statistic, you know, that control about 90% of the wealth of the country, right? Mm -hmm. It's crazy, right? And then we have seven, eight companies that control, you know, if you look at the value of the Dow or the S&P or the, or the NASDAQ, you have seven or eight companies that are worth trillions or close to trillions. And they're, you know, they're over concentrated in terms of wealth. So is that good? It's great that we have really competitive companies. It's not great that so much is concentrated there. Of course. Because if you go back to pre-depression era, we had a similar situation with the Rockefellers who controlled oil. We had the Carnegies. We had the Mellons. We had the Vanderbilts. We had all these people who were very entrepreneurial. They're iconic in business history. But what happened is we let it led to an overconcentration and the economy collapsed. And, you know, the, it's the old principle that the more people that are working, the more people that are competitively earning wages and incomes, the bigger the economy gets and the more consumption that you have in an economy. So it stands so, to so it stands to reason by your argument that if Latinos are the ones who are starting more small businesses at a faster rate than any other cohort in the United States right now, it, it's like having a garden and you have apples and you have pears, but your apples are doing great and you've got to decide where to put the most fertilizer because you only have so much fertilizer and you're putting it on the pears instead of the apples. I'm not the greatest businessman in the world, but I would think you should you should water and fertilize your apples, because that's where you're going to get your most growth, right? Yeah. Isn't this yeah. the same and, thing? And, and, and it's also not a zero-sum game. So sometimes it's just a matter of creating structures that enable that. Let me give you the example. This is what I keep on preaching to every financial sector leader and any business leader uh -huh. and, and economist that I talk to. You know, when, when China looked like it was going to be really the explosive growth nation that it has become 25 years ago people started creating funds structures they put capital into them and said okay we're going to go invest over here hmm. right i didn't know that and then about five or eight years later everybody saw the same thing with india and so what did they do they created fund structures they put capital in them and then they said go go invest now not the first investment. There was no guarantee it was going to make money. There was no guarantee that the second one was going to make money. But they knew that it was growing. So the likelihood, if you're smart and you know how to pick the right businesses or the right fund structures, you could grow. Guess what? A lot of companies made a lot of money over the last 25, you know, 30 years investing that way. Well, guess what? Right here in the center of the United States of America with not a different political regime, no transportation issues, all that sort of thing. We have a cohort that now is bigger than India and is going to grow disproportionately in the United States of America. So principle number one, got to solve this problem with capital. Right. And, and create structures. And that's where our, at Latitude, we're pushing a lot of the financial sector leaders to start thinking like entrepreneurs, like they did in the 20th century with the emergence of other global, you know, geographic opportunities. That's a great parallel. We have one here. That's a great and parallel. The second, yeah. And then the second thing, Rick, that I, uh, I'm glad you're doing this, uh, is that the media. I, I would encourage you, Rick, to go look at the media over the last four days. There's one company that dramatically sticks out in covering this issue. It's NBC Universal. They covered it. NBC Nightly News, CNBC, MSNBC, everywhere. Now, they're a, they're a media partner, but there are some others that didn't basically cover it. We even had Ameritrade that was covering it every day because they have a lot of traders and business investors. They wanted to, they wanted to stay tuned for what was happening each day and covering it. We had Axios, which is a next-generation platform 
they were covering that. They had people there at the event. But there were others. Do you hear those crickets? <laughs> they're not they're not covering it. How and, do you and I how, say I say what what is their duty in terms of helping all their audience, which a large portion could be Latinos and Latinas, but also their non-Latinos and Latinas that need to understand. Because that's the in, you know, that's the whole genesis of the news media is to cover what's news, not only what was news 50 years ago and the structures of 50 years ago, but the emerging structures. We, I'm telling you, we, we are, we are, and maybe that's the reason, you know, they say there's this thing called a hole in the marketplace in business and, and you should go where that hole is. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest in telling stories like these that you're sharing. I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, maybe I'm looking here now, we, I, what we're doing here, you know, Agua Media, the Rick Sanchez News podcast is growing at 440% as I'm looking at it right now. We, we literally are gaining tens of thousands of uh, downloads and listeners. And, and I want to thank those of you who are listening, by the way, because you're doing this. I mean, you you humble us by by wanting to be a part of this conversation. But you know, to a certain extent, it's almost like easy pickings. It's like, how do you not imagine this story? Imagine that tomorrow somebody told you that there was the existence of a country as big as Italy, but bigger, as big as Brazil, but bigger in terms of economy within the United States. And, and all you had to do was get out your, you know, your, your laptop and, and write that story and say, did you know that there was a country within the United States which has the economic power of Italy, the economic power of Great Britain, et cetera, et cetera? And you don't write that story. You, you don't even put that in your top three. You don't, you don't headline it. It just, it just seems crazy. How do you not do that? It's what we do. We tell Latino truths. Not because we're making them up, because this stuff is fascinating. And people are responding to what we're doing because they too find it fascinating. And people who are writing to me every day saying, thank you for doing this. My God, finally, somebody's coming around and just sharing some information that is out there. It's not a wah, 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 it's a look at this. So yeah, yeah. Saul, when you, say, when you say that some people still didn't cover this story, I, I just kind of shake my head. Why? Yeah, and I'm calling him out because as a business leader, as a person that cares about his country, and as a person that tries to tell truths, why, we're not all perfect, and I'm not perfect, mm. but the point is is that we try to tell truths. The storyline that the CEOs and everybody that were at the event kept on using was, boy, this is really a truth-telling story, mm. truth-telling conversations. And what we need is for the full media industry to step up and cover what's happening in 21st century America as opposed to still acting like we're in 20th century America. That's number one. And that's the that's the news media side. And then on the entertainment side, we had a big study done by the Latino Donor Collaborative. Ana Valdez uh, presented it that showed how the entertainment industry, there's only, again, one cohort that is driving the vast majority of volume growth, streaming, ticket sales, all that kind of stuff, which is the Latino cohort. And it's the most under-engaged cohort. The Anglo-American cohort overskews in terms of appearances and leads and all that vis-a-vis -vis the percentage of population. African-American exceeds overskews vis-a-vis -vis their population size versus portrayals and, and you know all that sort of thing. Representation. The yeah. Asian American now really has for you know in the recent years has now leaped le le leaped ahead in terms of over skewing. And then you have the Latino cohort that's nearly 20% of the population and 25 to 30% of the revenue volume and earnings volume of these companies and is sitting at 3%. Hmm. Makes no sense. No, you're right. Makes no sense. And so now one of the things I'm gonna start doing is talking to investor community and saying, if you're investing in this company and they're not, going where the growth is, how do you think about allocating your capital? Because all of us need to think like capitalists. Right. 
And Rick, I'm a capitalist. I believe that it works 92 and a half percent of the time. <laughs> Notice I didn't say 100. Right. Because there, there are times where it doesn't work and you need safety nets and you need other yeah. things. And there are greedy but people out there. And there, are, and there are greedy people out there who will sometimes take advantage of any system, including our own. Let's just. Yeah. Right. But, but that's part of a capitalist system. It's part of a monarchist. It's part of socialist. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at all these leaders of socialist countries. They have a lot of wealth and the poor people don't. Right. And so, so there's no perfect system. But the best one I've seen is the capitalist system. Now we as Americans want to see it work. We want to see it work according to the way the numbers are moving, where their growth opportunities are, where they can make more money, and also then represent, because they're going to be representing to make money, you know, who their audiences are. Is, that, is it part of our DNA? We, we seem to, you talk about market-driven things all the time. I've learned a lot from you, Saul. And you talk about how capitalism, when it's not crony and when it's not greedy and when it's just, can be the solution to many of the problems in this country. And Latinos seem to fit into that ideology that you just described very, very well um, in, in so many ways. I mean, we, we lead in mortgages. We lead in buying cars. We lead in attending church. We, we lead in family issues. We lead in so many of these areas that define what you just said. Do you think it's part of our DNA? Does it come from our grandparents? What, what, what is it about us that makes us such a good fit that sometimes is unappreciated? It's really interesting because a friend of ours, Gary Acosta, who is the co-founder of NARA, right. and they've been doing studies on real estate and mortgages and all that, and they do research, right? And Latinos for more than a decade have accounted for 52% of all net new mortgages taken out every year. Wow. And when they survey, there's one common theme. Latinos believe in the American dream. They're almost the last bastion of people that believe in the American dream, which is part of owning a home, having a great job, taking care of your family, being of faith work ethic, as we used to call it, you know, the Puritan work ethic, but it's really the Latino work ethic, yeah, they, which is- we, we talk if, we talk about something on this show a lot, and I use this word a lot. It's vergüenza. Vergüenza is a word that's very Latino. It, it almost means shame. Do yourself, do your family, do all of that, your children, your wife, your, your husband, your whatever, do them proud and never let your name be shamed. And it's it's something we learn from our abuelas and our abuelas. And I think it kind of keeps us a little bit on the straight and narrow as well, don't you think? Yeah. And it, and it's really important. So when we think about this, this notion that says you need to always do more, you need to do more for your family, not just for yourself. You need to do more for your community. I mean, look at the military. I mean, the Latino cohort is overskewing again there in protecting our country. Look at COVID during the peak pandemic period of time. Guess who the patriots of this country were? They were the workers on the front line, serving all of us who were staying indoors, not going anywhere. They were serving us. That's what I call a real patriot that stands out there when there's risk, when there's sadly a lot of deaths, it was it was a horrible period, and the Latino cohort was there serving everybody. The Marine Corps Commandant of the United States was recently quoted as saying, I'm telling my people we're filled up as far as Latinos go. We gotta look for somebody else because our entire corps is being filled with Latinos. There's more Latinos at a faster rate in the Marine Corps than any other cohort in the history of the United States. And I think that 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 says something. But the statistic that I love. And maybe it's because, you know, I started this show today thinking about my daughter and what she said to me. And, you know, my dad recently passed and I remember him and I remember what he instilled in us. So there's this statistic out there that I always look at and I share with people among all the There's so many statistics about Latinos and what we are and what we do. But this one really stands out. The average Latino in the United States works 42 hours a week. The average non-Latino in the United States works 33 hours a week. 
I don't know why that statistic, and by the way, that's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States. Look it up. I don't know why that statistic hits me, but it goes back to that conversation you and I had once, I think it was like 10 years ago. So we had just met and we were getting together for the first time. I think we were going to go to a tennis match in South Florida. In fact, that's what it was. We, we were hanging out at a tennis match and and we were talking about our families and our fathers and our lives. And, you know, we've done okay and we should be grateful to God for that. But you looked at me and you said, you know, what we are somos burros. <laughs> we're, we're mules. I mean, and I, I take pride in that. I do. I take pride in that. And being a part of a community that never says no to more work, you know, and another opportunity. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things is is that we have this ethic about working. I mean, people always ask me, how, why do you go so long and so hard? You know, you, you're everywhere, you're doing all these things. And I say, because that's the way it is. That's the way I was brought up. That's the way my DNA is, et cetera. And you're exactly right, because this cohort really does. They, they overskew on everything, everything good. Uh, here, including crime rates. You know, the safest cities in America are generally those that are heavily populated by Latinos yeah. across the country. And so I, I, I don't want to overstate the story here because I am proud as a Latino. I've always been proud Me too. as a Latino. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, we just need to help everybody understand that there's not a threat here there's an opportunity. There's the neighboring, the friends, the business partnerships. There's all kinds of things that can be happening at a faster rate, investments coming at a faster rate than what has been happening. And it's going to be good for everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, Rick, I say this, and I say this clearly with a mathematical understanding. If you think about the growth of our country over the next de few decades, of GDP, this country is highly dependent upon the Latino cohort to be growing at the rate it has been and on into the future. So if you're doing a regression analysis, if you're a statistician, my bet is that the R squared, which is the predictive element to it, would say that it's at least 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So this country cannot grow without this cohort. And this cohort cannot grow at the rate it possibly could without the investment and the partnerships and the capital and all those things. And so it's a positive story. It's one plus one equals three or five or 10 if we do this right as a nation. So we start acting like the United States of America again, as opposed to all these divided states and divided dividing issues that have existed. I am proud of my country and I want my country to be as successful as possible. One last story then, real quickly. In the 80s, as a business person, I was a young executive, and we kept on talking about Japan and how Japan was gonna be the number one economy by the year 2000, because it was growing faster than the United States. It was modernizing, it was doing all kinds of things. And then this guy Reagan came in and he started talking about, well, we don't wanna let that happen. And we need to start investing more in our infrastructure. We need to modernize, all that sort of thing. And he created a, a, you know, he and Stockman created this other thing called the investment tax credit. And I was an executive in my company where we modernized in the, in the late 80s and the 90s our infrastructure. We got ready for Y2K. <laughs> and during that period of time, we had the highest GDP growth rate, right? And all of a sudden, we hit the year 2000, and Japan was not passing the United States as a competitive nation. We hear these forecasts about China, right? It's inevitable. China's going to be bigger. They got a billion people. They got this or that. People forgot. Again, I, I apologize, Rick, that I look for math <laughs> on almost any, any issue. Yeah. So they had a single child policy that they started about 25 years ago. And guess what that's now starting to translate into? A labor force growth rate decline to almost negative. And it's going to happen there. It's, it's starting to show its signs. And they're going to have their own problems. So I'm a guy that sits here as an American. I love competing. I love winning. And I want my country to be number one 
not only in 2022, but in 2032 and 2042, because I want my kids, my grandkids, and whatever, you know, all their friends and neighbors to sit there and still look at the United States of America as, as we would say in Spanish, that every American would understand. We want to be numero uno. Well, there you go. Um, Saul Trujillo is in many ways a big part of what we do here because, you know, uh, full transparency, Saul is a partner in what we do here at Agua Media. You know what our mission is. You know what we believe in. We just want to tell the Latino truths that often aren't told. And I want to thank you for watching, for listening, for being a part of what we do, for joining us in this in this in this story that we're telling um you know darn well that we're already on we're spotify we're on apple wherever you get your podcast and do me a favor if there's somebody else out there and you want them to hear this story if you want them to be a part of this thing this thing we call agua media this thing we call rsn the rick sanchez news even part of latitude and the growth of our community let somebody else know share this idea let them know that there's now a place where we tell these stories because we're really just too happy to be a part. We're serving. That's what we're doing here. I, I'm just serving. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just laying out the information. It's not mine. It belongs to all of us. And if you happen to be listening to us, obviously, on uh, YouTube, then, you know, hit that subscribe button as well because we want this party to get as big as it can possibly get. I am just really proud to be a part of it, and I'm so happy to have a chance to have this conversation today with you here, Saul. Thanks for joining us for this. This is important. Thank you, Rick, and thank you for what you're doing, because as I've often said, for those of you that are in the audience, you know, I've always thought of Rick as a truth teller, and he can be a truth teller for all of us as Americans. And with a wider angle lens, I'm a believer that I've had the great opportunity and fortune to operate businesses all over the world. And I wasn't born with the wider angle lens. I grew the wider angle lens. And when we all get that perspective to look at things with, with a wider aperture, we only get better, we only get stronger, and we also get smarter. So true. And that's what we do. We tell truths. So thanks to you and thanks to Saul, and uh, we'll be looking for you again. And remember, as we always like to say, adelante y vamos con todo. Agua.